Um, no, it's open to anybody. Is it? Okay, just on my on. screen it is. On my end, I'm actually gonna make you a co-host. Welcome everybody. Uh, Mara, welcome. My Dalman. Hi, Linda. Sorry, hello, if you were speaking with me. Sorry, I was muted. No worries. Hi, Ruby. Tamar. Hi, <laughs> uh, Harlig, welcome. Thank you. All right, we're just about to get started. Take your time. With the last technical bills. Hi, Rabbi Doobie. Ah, well, you heard this. Welcome. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. I'm going to mute everybody. If anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to use the chat. You can message publicly or privately. It's up to you. All right, welcome to tonight's lecture part two of our summer series. We are currently during the three weeks of the Jewish calendar where we mourn and commemorate the destruction of both Beis HaMikdash, both holy temples which stood in Jerusalem but we're not just mourning the tragedies of then, but the tragedies that our nation has gone through over the past 2000 years. On top of that, we are currently living in very interesting times, constantly being bombarded from Facebook messages, posts, emails, WhatsApps, every news site. Every time we look up, things seem to be getting worse all this craziness out there, tragedy, pain. What do we do? See, as Jewish people, we know that we always must look a little bit deeper, strengthen our hope and our faith. And that's how over the past more than 2000 years, we didn't just survive as a nation, but we have thrived as a nation. In order to do this, we have to be able to take a good look around us, but at ourselves as well, and start to see things from a very different we have to be able to take a good look around us. perspective. Now, who better to guide us and to help us with certain tools in order to accomplish this? We have Rabbi Label Wolf here with us, the founder and the director of Spirit Grow. He guides people in self-mastery of the mind, of the consciousness. He's lectured in over 500 cities throughout the world. I've witnessed Rabbi Wolf himself on a, just a regular Shabbos, just a regular class in Melbourne, literally transforming people. He definitely won't let us down. And like Rabbi Wolf was saying before, he's not so far away from Wisconsin, way back a little time ago. He spent some time changing students' lives in Madison. Now, before we get started with our program, 
we have another special thing tonight. And that is we have the opportunity as much as COVID has taken away from us, it has also given us some amazing opportunities to connect with people we never would have connected with. We have a rabbi in Australia giving a lecture to some people, a community in Wisconsin, but it's not just Wisconsin tonight. We're also teaming up with our friends out in Miami, in Kendall and Pinecrest. Rabbi Harlick, please. Thank you, thank you very much. You know, now people are scared to get together with people from Miami and Kendall. I don't know if Wisconsin welcomes us, but through Zoom, we are welcome. And that's uh, something very special. And exactly what the Rabbi Lisker said, that's what says your name on your uh, feed. Hopefully I'm not picking a dove as your <laughs> son or my daughter, my kids. Sometimes I have my kids' names on my thing. So I apologize if that's the name. That exactly the point, Zoom, I mean, this moment has brought a lot of challenges, but it actually brought many people together, communities together. In the past, if we wanted to be with Mequin, we had to go on a trip together in Israel, we had to travel together in New York, and now we could be sitting in our house, and I see some people that used to live in Kendall, now they're living in Alabama and other places, that we could all join together. So tonight, what's so beautiful about it is we have two communities together, uh, coming to listen to Rabbi Wolf. Now, what's so special about Rabbi Wolf is Rabbi Wolf is the first speaker that my wife and I brought out to speak in our community in 1995. Rabbi Wolf, see, that's uh, this was our first speaker. We were here maybe a month or two, and we did it in someone's house, and it was uh, very, very special. We had you back numerous times after that, you were the one who broke the ice, and I should see Alan Leibowitz on the call tonight. He was from sure he was there that night too, and um, it's a great honor to be here tonight and to listen to you speak and have you as one of our first uh, speakers on Zoom. So that's also very special. So thank you very much, the community of Mequon, of allowing us to join together both communities together. Thank you to uh, both of you rabbis. It's a, a great honor. Clearly, I have some relationship with both of you, having been in Wisconsin, in Madison, and uh, um, having been a quarter of a century ago, as it works out, with you, Rabbi Harley, for the first time. And all of you that I'm uh, so happy to meet with and see and discuss and learn from you. That's why I'm a little selfish in terms of uh, my career path. The reason I enjoy teaching so much is because from each one of you, I learn something more. So please do feel free to uh, uh, speak with me. Let's have a nice interactive session instead of a, uh, let's have a Socratic dialogue. The way I'm going to structure the session is I'm going to um, divide into three parts. The first part, I'm going to discuss the nature of the human being and the personality, both from a vantage point of uh, physiology and psychology, as well as Hasidus, the Jewish spiritual teachings and understandings of the deeper labyrinth of the nature of individual, and also our place in the cosmos at large. So that'll be the first uh, part of our discussion. Um, the second part of our discussion won't be a discussion. I'm going to lead a meditation um, based on our discussion. And hopefully that will with, implant within you some of the aspects of the discussion. So it becomes part of you as I'll explain what the purpose of meditation is. And I'll introduce that. And the third part will be you and I talking to each other and learning even more from each other. Let me begin in this way. Who are you? Who am I? At some level, everything is a whirling dervish dance of molecules, interacting, interfacing. And at a mass level, this assumes shape and proportion in a physical material world. So at some level, you and I, if we had an electron microscope that peered into us, the truth of the matter is we would be electrons, protons, we would be um, mainly empty space because the space between the electron and the proton and particles themselves is huge. The same proportion as Earth is spatially separated from the sun. So it's actually a wonder that we are anything, the why we even look like we do look if we, if we are empty space. But let me explain it in this way. You and I are a spiritual umbilical cord. 
of spiritual flow from a place called Ein Sof, infinity, godliness, transcending through multi-worlds of spirituality until ultimately that spirituality becomes so thick, so dense, that it's perceived as materiality, world, space, time. If I were to put it in more simple terms, say on this side of the spectrum, I have something very heavy called lead. Lead is extremely dense. I move across the spectrum a little bit further and I get something that's less dense and we call it wood, timber. Move further across and I have a material called water. Move further across, I have air. Move even further across and I start to have components, which we have molecular components. Further across, atoms. Particles that make up the atoms. The uh, uh, missing Higgs boson, which everyone's looking for in the physics world. And then we tend to stop because science can only deal with what is measurable, identifiable. It can perhaps through mathematics predict, but until it's measured, it doesn't exist. But what in fact underlies the materiality of even the tiniest particle? So in our Jewish spiritual teachings, we go further across that spectrum and we end up having spirituality, the force that underlies the beginnings of matter, no matter how small. And even in spirituality, there's a whole spectrum going thick spirituality, thin spirituality, very thin spirituality, and onwards and onwards infinitely. You and I transcend right across that spectrum in a way except let's talk about it vertically. We call it your soul. That's the underlying energy. Let's just use that word, neshama, generally speaking. Your neshama begins at that ein sof, infinite source, underlying everything. It then transcends through four parallel worlds. Atzilus, Bria, Yetzirah, and Asiya. Doesn't matter what we call them. But each one is, if you, if you will, thicker than the one before until it becomes expressed in the world of time and space here. And that's you, that's me. Our personality is ultimately the product of that journey of our neshama through these worlds and it becomes manifested through a body. Now, what's the body? The body is a separate element. The body is like the spacesuit. The neshama finds itself in a very rarefied atmosphere of time and space. It doesn't operate well within time and space. It needs a medium. So Hashem created a body, a spacesuit for it. And that's, by the way, why we have an absolute mitzvah to maintain health and wellness. And I emphasize that in our particular moment in history. The mitzvah of health and wellness is no less a mitzvah than Shabbos and Kashrus and anything else whatsoever. Because in order to allow our inner self, our true self, our inner personality, which is located in the neshama, to express optimally, the spacesuit has to operate well. In other words, we have to be healthy and optimal so that our inner self can express. So we are a duality in that respect. In fact, Hashem created everything in a state of duality. Everything comes in twos. Have you noticed? Two hands, two eyes, two feet, two hemispheres of the brain, and even our perception of reality, up, down, left, right, positive, negative, particle wave, yin, yang, you name it. It all comes in dualities. Likewise, our neshama, as that strand of the spiritual umbilical cord descends and becomes invested in the very first moment that matter comes into being in the human form, which is conception in the womb of the mother. At that point, 
it's as if that singular strand splits into two. One part will become our so-called lower order self, our ego self, we call that the Nefesh Bahamis, and the other strand we call Nefesh Elokis, which is the true strand that connects us to altruism, other-centeredness, compassion, and godliness. And therefore we go through life also dualistically. In other words, in a conflict. We're constantly in a state of exercising choice. Choice means at least two. Without this duality, there'll be no choice. And therefore deliberately Hashem made us into, if you will, a split personality. One part of us seeks food, clothing, shelter, higher order self-actualization as Maslow's model proposes. And the other strand seeks fulfillment, otherness, a sense of the infinite. And these two constantly are in conflict with each other. In any one moment, we're either seeking in some shape or form, self-preservation, me, I, or we're trying to express ourselves and connect with the otherness of the world. And we're constantly in conflict, in a positive conflict, though at times it can become negative. So these two features, the Nefesh Bahamis, self-centeredness, and Nefesh Elokis, altruism, are the basis of meaning in life. Can you imagine what you and I would be like if we had no capacity for choice? If we couldn't choose? In fact, let me make it quite clear. If we didn't have the capacity to choose, to murder, to steal, to cheat, on the one hand, to help, to confer, to assist, on the other hand, our lives would be meaningless. If we didn't have that choice, who would we be? We would be mechanical. We would be amoeba. We'd be responding on cue. We'll be robotic, automatons, devoid of any meaning in life whatsoever. So ironically, it's our capacity to choose right from wrong that gives us life's meaning. Hence, Hashem provide us with the duality of these two strands of our neshama. The purpose of Jewish life, to be able to practice self-mastery to that extent that the higher order self always dominates over the lower order self. Let me take one step further. The lower order self isn't per se negative. <clears throat> Excuse me. The lower order self, the Nefesh Bahamis, simply allows us to subsist. I need to have food, clothing, and shelter. Otherwise, I can't survive. The problem with the Nefesh Bahamis, the lower order self, is it has no boundaries. It doesn't know when to stop. Food? No, I'll only eat hot cuisine. Whatever Master Chef does, nothing less. Clothing? Well, it's got to be designer label. Without designer label, I'm not wearing it. And my wardrobes have to be filled to the point that there will come a moment when I need that set of clothing in five years' time. Shelter, I've got to have the most beautiful home. Uh, the mansion of gone with the wind. Um, I've got to have chandeliers in every room, including the toilet. In other words, the Nefesh Bahamis is constantly wanting more and more and more. It doesn't know when to stop comes along the higher order self and says, thank you, lower order self. You're doing me a great service. You're allowing me to exist, but I want to tame you. You're a wild stallion and I need to utilize you for a higher order self. And that's what we do in life. We're in a state of choosing the higher from the ordinary, from the profound, from the mundane. And that's what we do all the time. So that is a little bit of a discussion as to who we are and how we operate in context of life. I introduced a term earlier, self-mastery. It's a common term. The idea that somehow or other, 
our flow of consciousness can be directed. Now, what do I mean? First, what is consciousness? Let me put it this way. If you were, or I were, or someone were to die, God forbid, there's hundred and twenty. we should live to 120. When someone dies, five seconds later, we test their hearing, and of course, they can't hear. And yet, physiologically, there's been no decomposition. The physiology of the ear is completely intact. Why can't they hear? Well, you'll say that's obvious because they're dead. But what does it mean, death? Likewise with the eye. So when a person is alive, there must be a further factor involved because the machinery of the ear is still intact initially after death. And of course, that particular missing link is what we discussed earlier, the energy underlying matter or the neshama the spiritual force, call it whatever you will. That underlying energy intersecting with the machinery of the ear produces a consciousness called hearing. And when that travels through the physiology of the eye, the way we experience that is seeing. When it impacts through the machinery, the very complex machinery of brain, the result is mind or intelligence or intellect or, or cogitation, whatever the English, many English words for it suggest. So consciousness is the sum total of the spiritual energy flowing through the machinery of the body. Total consciousness is the total effect at any one point in time of all that spiritual energy flowing and coursing through the manifold aspects of human being. That's what consciousness is. Okay, so how do I practice self-mastery? How do I control consciousness? And what does it mean to control consciousness? If consciousness is the sum total, what's beyond that? So we learn in the deeper spiritual teachings through Chassidus explaining Kabbalah, that that spiritual umbilical cord that I spoke about earlier and its intersection through four parallel spiritual worlds creates levels of the neshama's aptitude. In fact, the neshama has five aptitudes. We call them nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yechida. And it's as if the lowest aptitude is the one that you and I are commonly aware of, and we call that consciousness. But there's a higher part of self looking down, if you will, on that level of consciousness and saying, hold on, direct it this way, direct it that way. And then there's a higher part directing that and onwards and onwards. I won't go into any detail because that can be easily confusing in our initial session. You have two wonderful rabbis here who are very well versed in the, the teachings of Hasidus and can explore that further with you. What does it mean five levels of the neshama? What does it mean intersecting through four plus one worlds, etc.? But what I'm suggesting to you here is, yes, you and I do have the capacity to practice directing consciousness. I'll, I'll prove it to you. Do this, take your two index fingers, and allow them to touch, so. And I want you to become aware of which finger is touching which. Now, it's not a joke. If you actually close your eyes and focus, you'll find that one is a much slightly more active toucher and the other one a slightly less touchy, being touched. One is active, one seems to be more passive. Work out which is which. And now switch. Yes, switch. Make the other one the active toucher. You can do it. You can direct the consciousness flow between the fingers. And you can switch back. And if you practice it, you'll be able to do it at will. Okay. Some of you will be practicing after the session saying, what's he talking about? I can't do it, there's something wrong with me. Don't worry, eventually we can all do it. All I'm demonstrating is that you and I can direct 
the flow of consciousness and we can master it. And what does it mean to master ourselves? So here's another piece of information that I'd like to share with you, more in the realm of physiology. We assume habits in life. What is a habit? A habit is a repetitive process that somehow stays. Now, since our technology of being able to peer into the brain has improved to such an extent over the last decade, we can actually see on screen what's happening in here, in the brain. And what we recognize is that when you think a thought, what's happening is that there's a neurotransmitting flow between one nerve and fiber of a cell to another nerve and fiber of another cell. As you repeat that thought over and over again, maybe daily, maybe whatever frequency, many times a day, what you're doing is you're training that neurotransmitting pattern. Or if I could put it colloquially, you're making a deeper groove for that flow. Therefore, the more that you think that, the more you will think that because it becomes much easier for that neurotransmitting flow to take place. Do it often enough and it becomes a habit. And it can become a habit then of negative thinking or positive thinking. It can make a person a pessimist. It can make a person an optimist. Of course, life's circumstances impinge on that heavily, but we're conscious and aware we can withstand that. But the point I'm making is that once a particular groove of the mind is set, it's like trying to fight a fight with one hand tied behind one's back. The habit will always be the default. What I'm talking here about is undoing that default. So for example, some people consult me about the fact that they wake up three o'clock in the morning and they can't go back to sleep. So what do we do? Usually, what they do is they ruminate at three o'clock in the morning on certain thought sequences, usually negative, fearful, hurtful ones. And since they do at three o'clock each morning, it's very likely they'll keep waking up three o'clock each morning and having that experience. How do we undo it? The short answer is we have to create a new pathway and we have to make that old pathway become disused grass and moss has to grow over it and it has to be completely eradicated. But how do you do that? You do that by practicing the new one. So I give them a series of two or three thoughts, which they actually conjure up from their own personal history, very strong thoughts, thoughts of positive thoughts, thoughts of ecstasy, thoughts of extreme happiness, certain images in their lives. And they practice it three times a day for a month under my tuition. And then what happens is that that old system of neurotransmission of thought of the old pathway tends to go away because they're displacing it constantly with the new one. Now, I've certainly simplified that discussion considerably, but the point is we can undo habits, which is another way of saying I can master my flow of consciousness. And Hashem gave us a wonderful opportunity. Why? Because you cannot think of two thoughts at exactly the same time. Have you noticed? You can't. You can oscillate quickly between two thoughts, but you can't think of two thoughts in the identical time. Therefore, if you displace a negative thought with a positive thought, the result will be you'll be focused and conscious of the positive thought. And the more you do that, the more that becomes the default. And the more likely you'll stay asleep at three o'clock in the morning. Now, let's put, it sim let's put it simply. So what am I saying? Jewish self-mastery is to be able to take our higher order self, nefesh elokis, altruism, God-centeredness, confidence, a sense of future, and displace the machinations of the lower order self, which tends to be insecure and seek security and expresses fear and projects always the most extreme future scenarios, catastrophic thinking, 
which we all jump to. This COVID is going to wipe out humanity. I am so at risk. Tomorrow is going to be much worse than today. Well, you're not a prophet. At least I don't think you're a prophet. And if you're not a Navi or Navia, if you're not a prophet, you don't know about tomorrow. There's a 50-50 statistical probability that tomorrow will be much better than today or much worse than today. And since you don't know, why do you jump to the conclusion of the negative? Because that's your default nefesh behamis, your lower order self, the fear factor. If you can train yourself to be optimistic, there's going to be two big pluses. And now I'm going to pause in this discussion, but I'll tell you these two big pluses. There's a Harvard University um, research that came out last year, which is wonderful. It tells us what makes people happy. Of course, the study of happiness with Martin Seligman and others has been going on for a long time. But this particular study proved very, very unequivocally that the singular factor that creates happiness in people's lives, head and shoulders ahead of other factors is relationships. Warm, loving relationships correlates with happiness much more. Here's another one. People don't like to relate to pessimists. People like to relate to optimists. And therefore, if your default response is negative, the result is your relationships will suffer and your happiness quotient will go down. That's one big plus of being able to master your attitudinal response. If you're not a prophet, go for the 50%. The cup is half full, not half empty. The other one is as follows. We have clear evidence, mind body stuff, that people who are positively disposed are healthier, that their immune system is higher. And what more important a factor in today's COVID-19 environment for us to be safe other than that, our personal immunity should be optimal. And therefore, positive thinking is essential in order to maintain that. There's clear evidence how positivity improves the health of the body and increases immunity. So I'm giving you two reasons why you should choose nefesh elokis, positive disposition, confidence, as opposed to insecurity of the nefesh bahamis, fear, etc. Okay, so how do you practice um, directing the flow of consciousness? How do I change? Well, there are many tools, but the tool that I often use is meditation. Meditation is just a word. If you look and consult Professor Google, Professor Google will give you hundreds of different definitions of what meditation is. Meditation doesn't mean anything anymore. If you want to know the common denominator behind all true meditations, it is focusing. That is the common denominator. What you focus on and why you focus on that depends on the intent and goals of the pathway, be it spiritual or psychological, underlying that meditative practice. We have to be very careful with meditation because when I was in Madison, Wisconsin, um, 60s, 70s was exactly the period when some very enterprising Hindu gurus made their way across to the West and started to introduce their format of meditation. Now, there's nothing wrong with meditation per se, but when the meditation includes elements that we call Aveda Zara, things that are hurtful to the Jewish soul because they're idol worship oriented, we have to be extremely careful. So the Rebbe in a celebrated uh, discourse in 1979 said, we must strip meditations that are commonly out there, which are Eastern in nature, but redeem their positive virtues. In other words, use meditation intentionally. There are two primary Jewish goals of meditation, insight and health. And I'm going to introduce in my meditative practice with you both of these elements. For example, the insight format of Jewish meditation, which is practiced a lot in Chabad, is called Hisboinenus. 
It comes from the Hebrew word bina. It's the reflexive grammatical form of the verb lahavin, uh, uh, to understand. Reflexive means that it is directed towards oneself. His boninus or hit boninut in modern Hebrew means to take the idea and allow it to become alloyed to oneself so you become the expressor of it in life. Example, rabbis and I will, will be, Rabbi Begun and Rabbi Halik and I will, before davening in the morning, will study what's called a maimer, a formal philosophical discourse of one of the masters, one of the rebbers. We will then take one strand, one thought, one insight, and then spend time focusing on it to such an extent that it becomes intertwined with my very beingness. I focus on it to make it mine, me, in such a way that during the course of the day, during the course of my life, I express it. That's his bonus meditation. Then there's the other formats of meditation, but the one that in our teachings, which the Rebbe has very much uh, promoted, is psychological and physical health. To be able to use meditation, for example, to de-stress the body. We know full well that stress causes amazing hurt and harm to the body and, of course, to our lives. And by the way, Stress isn't out there doing things to you. There's no such thing as stress out there. You create stress. I create stress by my interpretation of the data. It's me who interprets the information. It's me listening constantly to the media projections of doom and gloom, because after all, the media is not a beneficent educational in institution. The media is a commercial enterprise with one goal in mind, profits. And they know well the psychology that if they can frighten you, you'll be glued to the screen. And if you're glued to the screen, ratings go up. And if ratings go up, profits go up because advertisers go up. So therefore you constantly have a stream of fearful messages. Our sense of perspective in our world is completely distorted. That's not to diminish the danger but any element of danger can be distorted in the perspective of life. We know that 97% of all people survive COVID very well, thank you, even though they have it. And 85% if it's serious. That's overwhelming. The morbidity rate is extremely low percentage wise. I'm not diminishing the fact that its morbidity is higher than the flu meaning its ability to kill a person who has underlying issues of older age is much higher. Therefore, older people specifically or people with underlying issues have to take much greater care. But in the whole perspective of it, we have to have confidence that you'll be in the 95 percentile, not in the 5 percentile. But I walk around and people are talking to me as if they for sure are in the 5 percentile. Perspective. Not diminishing the danger, but perspective. That comes from having a vantage point which is much more evenly balanced than what is out there in the world. So when we meditate and focus on having positivity, sense of personal safety, the stress sore that you and I create will be negated. We have to be conscious, we have to be aware, we have to be careful, but not necessarily stressed to the point that our bodies hurt. So there are meditations based on that. Okay, so what I want to do now is to uh, conduct two meditations, which I'll conduct as one single flow. I'll uh, segue from one to the other. The first one is going to be based on breath, using breath as a focus, not an uncommon focus in many different meditative techniques. But for Jewish people, we learn a much more profound aspect. The Hebrew word for breath is neshima. The Hebrew word for soul is neshama. Clearly, the two words have the common root. What we understand and know is, through Hasidus, that the way you breathe reveals 
an aspect of the flow of your neshama within. Uh, I'm just reminded that there's a wonderful uh, uh, little episode in uh, in Sefer Shemois, in the uh, second book of the Bible, um, where there is an old individual, an elderly gentleman, wanders in from the desert, long white beard, and he says to his brothers and sisters, you are going to be free to go to the promised land. Now, do you remember how the people react? They say, go away, old man. We're busy right now. We've got a certain set of tasks to carry out. We have a quota, otherwise they'll beat us. And Rashi, the very, very great commentator on the Chumash, notes that they spoke mikoitzer ruach, from shortness of breath. When people are stressed, their breathing becomes quicker and shallower. The breathing comes from the upper areas of the lungs and faster. And that's what Rashi was noting amongst the, uh, our Jewish ancestors. Therefore, we know from our teachings that if you can slow down your breath and deepen it, lower down, even down to the abdomen, which we now call abdominal breathing, the result is we can undo stress and undo hurt to the body. So that'll be our first exercise. The second exercise, I'm going to give you um, a visualization where I'm going to show you how you can create an imagery of safety as a counter to the media projection of everyone being at such high risk. Again, I want to emphasize, I am not diminishing the dangers that are out there, but I am saying perspective and a sense of personal optimism. Okay, just assume a position of symmetry, sitting where you might be, feet symmetrically on the ground below you, your hands resting on knees and thighs, your back fairly straight without being too rigid. Your head well balanced on your shoulders. The head is a very heavy part of the body. And gently close your eyes. And just focus on your breath. Gently breathing in and breathing out quite normally. Now, if you can, prefer to breathe in and out through your nose. And become aware of the difference in temperature of the air entering the nasal passages compared to the temperature of the air leaving the nose. Cooler air entering slightly warmer air exiting. And just stay focused on that temperature differential. And slow down and deepen your in and out breath through the nose, emphasizing the difference in temperature in your mind. And with your next slow breaths in, direct your breath down toward your abdomen and breathe out. And the way to achieve that is, as you breathe in, expand your abdomen to collect the air and then pull your abdomen in to expel the air. So take a slow, deep breath in, expanding your abdomen, collecting the air, and then pulling it in to expel the air. The trick is to expand your abdomen on your in-breath. Slower and deeper, the easier it gets. 
So practice it for a few breaths. It's a little counterintuitive. Expanding your abdomen with the in-breath, slowly and deeply. And now let's lend some rhythm to the breathing. We'll breathe in for a count of three. We'll hold for a count of three and breathe out for a count of four. So take a slow, deep breath in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four. Abdominally, in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four. Just practice, continue breathing deeply, slowly, abdominally, rhythmically, smoothly, graceful breathing, a perfect circle. And at the back of your mind, just become aware how relaxed you've become in the space of a few short minutes. God breathes in and out, pulsating the world, night and day. The tide comes in, the tide goes out, the petals open, the petals close. God breathes and animates reality in the world. And in that relaxed state, let's move to the second exercise. Become aware of a light source in the center of your head, a source of light and warmth right in the middle of your head, creating light and warmth throughout your face, head, back of your neck, feeling pleasantly warm and comfortable. Increase the intensity of that light so it begins to flow down your neck into your torso, your chest. Feel the warmth and light lighting up the upper half of your body, emanating from the center of your head, feeling warm and comfortable Intensify that source of light in your head so it now moves down your body to the lower half of your body. Feeling your body warm, light, comfortable. Intensify that light even further in your head. So now the light moves down to your limbs, to your thighs, legs, feet, toes. And now through your shoulders, 
arms, wrists, hands, fingers. Your whole body feels that glow pleasantly with warmth and brightness. Intensify the source of light further so that it begins to glow through your skin, creating a brightness around your body, an aura surrounding your body. This aura is your personal spiritual protection. We call it the Magen Avraham, Abraham's shield. Be aware of that aura around you that you generate. And this Magen Avraham protects you at all times. As soon as you are aware of it and generate it, it's activated, much like a mezuzah. Intensify the light in your head further so that the aura around you spreads to encompass everyone in your home, filling your home, protecting your home. And intensify it even further so the aura spreads into the world contributing to its goodness, positivity. You make a difference with your aura, with your Magain Abraham. Once again, become aware of the aura just around you. Be comfortable with it. Feel safe with it. You are protected. Focus again on your breath, gently breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. The temperature difference, cooler air entering, warmer air exiting. Begin moving your fingers and your toes Wherever you are, move your fingers now, move your toes. And when you feel ready, gently open your eyes, coming all the way back to our session together. Well, I hope you enjoyed that journey. And I hope I haven't put anyone to sleep. There are many exercises. What is an exercise? Same as in uh, athletics. An exercise means to strengthen some aspect of the person. Spiritual exercises of meditation to strengthen our inner self, our spiritual self. Why start with the center of the head? Because that's where the spiritual umbilical cord enters our being and spreads through the body. 
So what have I done in the session? I've tried to explain a little bit about the dynamics of personality. There's much, much more to be said, but I want to indicate there is a duality, there's choice, and that you and I have the capacity to exercise choice wisely, which is after all what we need to do in our day and age, much more so than even yesteryear. And I've tried to indicate that we can train in such a way that we can become de-stressed as opposed to distressed. And also we can feel a sense of confidence about our capacity to withstand elements outside of us. Now you might say, yeah, but that was just a visualization. But you know, all our beliefs are based on visualizations. The fact that you believe perhaps that tomorrow is going to be worse than today is also based on visualizations of negativity. Likewise, positivity. You have to choose. So perhaps with that, I'll pause so that we have an opportunity to speak to each other and ask questions and uh, compare notes. And I'd love to hear from you. And by the way, if you wish to have any meditations from me, um, I put up on the chat screen my email address. I hope it's still there. And you can email me. I send out daily meditations on WhatsApp. So if you email me with your cell number, I'm happily give you a daily meditation to ponder on as you choose, apart from other materials. So rabbis, take it away. Everybody feel free to unmute yourself if you have a comment, a question, or just something to discuss, but Rabbi, so far that was great. I feel lighter. <laughs> so you lose weight also. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to feel that I've browbeaten you into submission so quickly. Bruce, are you trying to talk? We can't hear you. Have to unmute. Let me unmute little him. Up at the bottom. Yeah. You're unmuted now. Okay, try it again. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you Rabbi? Hear? Can you hear now? Yes. Rabbi? Do you uh, recommend the books by Herbert Benson from Harvard? Relaxing? Very much so. Herbert Benson was one of the uh, first and pioneers of the approach of de-stressing, did a lot of research, as uh, clearly you know, um, wired individuals up so you could actually measure body changes on the basis of using breath-based meditation and noted that there were physiological changes of the body as you actually do that exercise to the point that uh, not only does your heartbeat change and the uh, 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 energy flow from the brain moves from alpha, beta to theta, uh, even your skin resistance quotient alters. Real physiological changes. In other words, when you do this for yourself, you change yourself. And when the Rebbe in the late 70s uh, proposed that we actually take and neutralize meditations so that they can be health-based rather than necessarily theological in nature, and to help the physiology of the body, Benson was one of the first ones who actually was able in the early 80s, I think, to be able to follow through in the kind of thing that they ever wanted. Were they associated at all? Did they know each other? No, they weren't, uh, to my knowledge. But, you know, there's an interesting phenomenon. And that is, and it's something that applies, uh, that is being discussed a lot in quantum physics. I don't know to what extent people are familiar with a famous uh, quantum physicist by the name of David Bohm. Um, but David Bohm was one of the individuals who wanted to study the relationship of uh, consciousness and matter. Um, very interesting idea that our consciousness affects matter and vice versa, that there's the interrelationship. And he proposed that underlying 
everything lies some common, call it substance, it's not a substance, from which we draw from. It's very much according to the Jewish teachings of uh, Has uh, in Hasidus of the fact that uh, elokus, godliness, underlies everything. At any rate, the point I'm making is this. When you and I think of something, it doesn't stop in our head. It enters somewhere into that underlying substance of the world. So for example, an interesting phenomenon, you'll find that when there are scientific breakthroughs in one part of the world, and another part of the world quite independently soon after, the identical breakthrough takes place. It's as if the first one puts something out there and out there it was picked up somewhere totally else. In other words, your thoughts don't stop in your head. And the Frida Kareba noted this very poignantly in his work called Likute Diburim on the first page, where he says, you can project a thought to someone across the other side of the world and through your thoughts, affect that person physically and spiritually. So it's very powerful what we project with our consciousness. So the Rebbe put out a thought, let's do it. And Benson picked it up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, That's not does, do, does reading the mimer in the morning, does that help also with the same kinds of things? Absolutely. I mean, when you dedicate yourself to attaching yourself to wisdom, whatever the wisdom might be, not only are you gaining from that wisdom, but your projection into the world becomes different. Uh, at a simplistic level, your interpersonal relationships become different. The way you perceive reality is different and that travels also. And that's what makes the world progress or God forbid, regress if the thoughts are negative. Well, thank you, Rabbi, thank you. Rabbi Wolf, what would you say are the obstacles people would run into if they wanted to continue such a lifestyle? So to these two questions, what, how would they continue such a lifestyle and what are the obstacles look out for? I think throughout history, the uh, suggestion, which I think one of your presidents could have been Roosevelt said, the main thing to fear is fear itself. Um, the idea of feeling inadequate, lacking self-esteem, not feeling that a person has a purpose in creation. So let me tell you very dogmatically, every single individual is a unique creation with an independent purpose. You are reincarnated into the world over and over again because you have something to offer that no one else in the world can. Otherwise, there's no need for you to have been reincarnated. Every single individual has a purpose of contribution, a unique gift that no one else has. And if we recognize that, when we get up in the morning and meditate on the moida ani, moda ani, that childlike affirmation, which we may have learned in Cheder or not ever learned at all, which is the beginning of the Siddur, that basically says in passing, you have restored to me my identity, my uniqueness, my individuality. When a person feels that, knows that, then the way they comport themselves in continuing in the exercise of life in the world becomes totally different. So it's these wisdom teachings and then the the capacity to interpolate it into our lives that makes a huge difference to everyone around us, our family, our friendship circle, our society as a whole. And this is what I fear most at the moment, that we're at the uh, uh, end of the, uh, we're just like being manipulated by forces that are entering into our consciousness through media that are unfortunately uh, uh, making us erode our sense of self-confidence and meaningfulness in life. So we have to be able to deal with that by positively practicing positivity. 
Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Rabbi Wolf. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Yes, Rabbi. Um, this is Jamie from Atlanta. And I wanted to say, as I just privately sent a message <laughs> to Dov Lisker, uh, this is, has been a meaningful and a very elevated lecture. My compliments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very yes. kind of you to say. Very, very well done. And very good, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Perhaps I can end with a little closing remark then. There are two words which I think can make a huge difference in our lives. The two words are emuna and bitachon. They translate as follows, and I won't take much of your time. Emuna means faith, but I don't know what faith, it's a big word. Bitachon means, or bitachon means trust. It's another big word. The Lubavitcher Rebbe explained it much more pragmatically. He said, Amuna is the belief that everything that has ever happened in your life is for your current good. No matter what it's been, even if it's been painful, God forbid, somehow or other, it's for this moment and it's for the good of this moment in ways that our limited minds will never be able to decipher. Bitochon is the belief that the challenge we face now will have a positive outcome. No matter what the challenge is, we will overcome, as has been popularly said by a very famous individual, Martin Luther King. In other words, Amuna deals from the past to the present. Whatever's ever happened is for our current good. Bitochen deals from the present to the future. The challenge I face now will have a positive outcome. I'm urging you to adopt these axiomatic propositions, these two propositions as beliefs. Can I prove these to you? No. Can you disprove them? No. We're on equal ground. But if you adopt this background to your life, Amuna and Bitochen, I assure you, You'll be a positively disposed individual. You'll be healthier. You'll have much better quality relationships and you'll feel very much purposeful in life. What's an axiom? An axiom is a belief. It means it can't be proven. Belief begins where reason leaves off. Since we're finite creatures, there'll always be something beyond our capacity to prove. So as an exercise, Adopt Amuna and Bitochen into your life, and I assure you, qualitatively, it'll change immensely and everyone around you. So I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to share some time together. Um, it's been my pleasure. Feel free to, as I said, email me and uh, with anything whatsoever, questions or otherwise. And rabbis, you have a wonderful task in front of you because I'm sure every one of these uh, uh, wonderful people out there are going to be now consulting you to learn more and more and more. Thank you so much. Rabbi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rabbi Wolf. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody, Rabbi for joining Wolf. us. Thank you, Rabbi. Can you thank share you, the Rabbi. Thank you so Kawa. much. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Nice seeing all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful class. Thank you very much. It was great. Thanks. Thank Hello, you. Alan. Wonderful. Hi, Bob. Great to see both of you. Ah, very nice to see you. How are you? Great to see you so well. Thank you.